Chapter 1 of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War Bits of Autobiography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp. Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War Bits of Autobiography by Ambrose Bierce. On a mountain. They say that the lumberman has looked upon the cheat mountain country and seen that it is good, and I hear that some wealthy gentlemen have been there and made a game preserve. There must be lumber, and I suppose sport, but some things one could wish were ordered otherwise. Looking back upon it through the haze of near half a century, I see that region as a veritable realm of enchantment the Alleghanies, as the delectable mountains. I note again their dim blue billows, ridge after ridge interminable, beyond purple valleys full of sleep, in which it seemed always afternoon. Miles and miles away, where the lift of earth meets the stoop of sky, I discern an imperfection in the tint, a faint graying of the blue above the main range, the smoke of an enemy's camp. It was in the autumn of that most immemorial year, the 1861st of our Lord, and of our heroic age, the first, that a small brigade of raw troops, troops were all raw in those days, had been pushed in across the Ohio border, and after various vicissitudes of fortune and mismanagement found itself, greatly to its own surprise, at Cheat Mountain Pass, holding a road that ran from nowhere to the southeast. Some of us had served through the summer in the three months' regiments, which responded to the President's first call for troops. We were regarded by the others with profound respect as old soldiers. Our ages, if equalized, would, I fancy, have given about twenty years to each man. We gave ourselves, this aristocracy of service, no end of military airs, some of us even going to the extreme of keeping our jackets buttoned and our hair combed. We had been in action, too, had shot off a Confederate leg at Philippi, the first battle of the war, and had lost as many as a dozen men at Laurel Hill and Carrick's Ford, whether the enemy had fled in trying, heaven knows why, to get away from us. We now brought to the task of subduing the rebellion a patriotism which never for a moment doubted that a rebel was a fiend accursed of God and the angels, one for whose extirpation by force and arms each youth of us considered himself specially raised up. It was a strange country. Nine in ten of us had never seen a mountain, nor a hill as high as a church spire, until we had crossed the Ohio River. In power upon the emotions, Nothing, I think, is comparable to a first sight of mountains. To a member of a plains tribe, born and reared on the flats of Ohio or Indiana, a mountain region was a perpetual miracle. Space seemed to have taken on a new dimension, areas to have not only length and breadth, but thickness. Modern literature is full of evidence that our great-grandfathers looked upon mountains with aversion and horror. The poets of even the seventeenth century never tire of damning them in good set terms. If they had had the unhappiness to read the opening lines of The Pleasures of Hope, they would assuredly have thought Master Campbell had gone funny and should be shut up lest he do himself an injury. The Flatlanders who invaded the Cheat Mountain country had been suckled in another creed, and to them Western Virginia, there was as yet no West Virginia, was an enchanted land. How we reveled in its savage beauties! With what pure delight we inhaled its fragrances of spruce and pine! How we stared with something like awe at its clumps of laurel, real laurel as we understood the matter, whose foliage had been once accounted excellent for the heads of illustrious Romans and such, mayhap to reduce the swelling. We carved its roots into finger rings and pipes. We gathered spruce gum and sent it to our sweethearts in letters. We ascended every hill within our picket lines and called it a peak. And by the way, during those halcyon days, the halcyon was there too, chattering above every creek, as he is all over the world, we fought another battle. 
It has not got into history, but it had a real objective existence. Although by a felicitous afterthought called by us who were defeated, a reconnaissance in force, its short and simple annals are that we marched a long way and lay down before a fortified camp of the enemy at the farther edge of the valley. Our commander had the forethought to see that we lay well out of range of the small arms of the period. A disadvantage of this arrangement was that the enemy was out of reach of us as well, for our rifles were no better than his. Unfortunately, one might almost say unfairly, he had a few pieces of artillery, very well protected and with those he mauled us to the eminent satisfaction of his mind and heart. So we parted from him in anger, and returned to our own place, leaving our dead, not many. Among them was a chap belonging to my company named Abbott. It is not odd that I recollect it, for there was something unusual in the manner of Abbott's taking off. He was lying flat upon his stomach, and was killed by being struck in the side by a nearly spent cannon shot that came rolling in among us. The shot remained in him until removed. It was a solid round shot, evidently cast in some private foundry, whose proprietor, setting the laws of thrift above those of ballistics, had put his imprint upon it. It bore, in slightly sunken letters, the name Abbott. That is what I was told. I was not present. It was after this, when the nights had acquired a trick of biting, and the morning sun appeared to shiver with cold, that we moved up to the summit of Cheat Mountain to guard the pass through which nobody wanted to go. Here we slew the forest, and builded us giant habitations, astride the road from nowhere to the southeast, commodious to lodge an army, and fitly loopholed for discomfiture of the adversary. The long logs that it was our pride to cut and carry, the accuracy with which we laid them one upon another, hewned the line and bulletproof, the cyclopean doors that we hung, with sliding bolts fit to be the mast of some great admiral. And when we had made the pile complete, some marplot of the regular army came that way and chatted a few moments with our commander, and we made an earthwork away off to one side of the road, leaving the other side to take care of itself, and camped outside it in tents. But the regular army fellow had not the heart to suggest the demolition of our Towers of Babel, and the foundations remain to this day to attest the genius of the American volunteer soldiery. We were the original game preservers of the Cheat Mountain region, for although we hunted in season and out of season over as wide an area as we dared to cover, we took less game probably than would have been taken by a certain single hunter of disloyal views whom we scared away. There were bear galore and deer in quantity, and many a winter day in snow up to his knees did the rider of this pass in tracking Bruin to his den, where I am bound to say I commonly left him. I agreed with my lamented friend the late Robert Weeks, poet. Pursuit may be, it seems to me, perfect without possession. There can be no doubt that the wealthy sportsmen who have made a preserve of the Cheat Mountain region will find plenty of game if it has not died since 1861. We left it there. Yet hunting and idling were not the whole of life's program up there on that wild ridge with its shaggy pelt of spruce and firs and in the riparian lowlands that it parted. We had a bit of war now and again. There was an occasional affair of outposts, sometimes a hazardous scout into the enemy's country, ordered, I fear, more to keep up the appearance of doing something than with a hope of accomplishing a military result. But one day it was brooded about that a movement in force was to be made on the enemy's position miles away at the summit of the main ridge of the Alleghenies, the camp whose faint blue smoke we had watched for weary days. The movement was made, as was the fashion in those prentice days of warfare, in two columns, which were to pounce upon the foemen from opposite sides at the same moment. Led over unknown roads by untrusty guides, encountering obstacles not foreseen, miles apart and without communication, the two columns invariably failed to execute the movement with requisite secrecy and precision. The enemy, in enjoyment of that inestimable military advantage known in civilian speech as being surrounded, always beat the attacking columns one at a time, or turning red-handed from the wreck of the first, frightened the other away. 
All one bright wintry day we marched down from our airy. All one bright wintry night we climbed the great wooded ridge opposite. How romantic it all was! The sunset valleys full of visible sleep, the glades suffused and interpenetrated with moonlight, the long valley of the Greenbrier stretching away to we knew not what silent cities, the river itself unseen under its astral body of mist. Then there was the spice of danger. Once we heard shots in front, then there was a long wait. As we trudged on, we passed something, some things lying by the wayside. During another wait, we examined them, curiously lifting the blankets from their yellow clay faces. How repulsive they looked, with their blood smears, their blank, staring eyes, their teeth uncovered by contraction of the lips. The frost had begun already to whiten their deranged clothing. We were as patriotic as ever, but we did not wish to be that way. For an hour afterward, the injunction of silence in the ranks was needless. Repassing the spot the next day, a beaten, dispirited, and exhausted force, feeble from fatigue and savage from defeat, some of us had the life enough left, such as it was, to observe that these bodies had altered their positions. They appeared also to have thrown off some of their clothing, which lay nearby in disorder. Their expression, too, had an added blankness. They had no faces. As soon as the head of our straggling column had reached the spot, a desultory firing had begun. One might have thought the living paid honors to the dead. No. The firing was a military execution. The condemned, a herd of galloping swine. They had eaten our fallen. But touching magnanimity, we did not eat theirs. The shooting of several kinds was very good in the Cheat Mountain country even in 1861. End of chapter 1。Chapter 2 of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War、Bits of Autobiography、by Ambrose Bierce。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A Little of Chickamauga。The history of that awful struggle is well known. I have not the intention to record it here, but only to relate some part of what I saw of it. My purpose not instruction, but entertainment. I was an officer of the staff of a federal brigade. Chickamauga was not my first battle by many, for although hardly more than a boy in years, I had served at the front from the beginning of the trouble, and had seen enough of war to give me a fair understanding of it. We knew well enough that there was to be a fight. The fact that we did not want one would have told us that, for Bragg always retired when we wanted to fight, and fought when we most desired peace. We had maneuvered him out of Chattanooga, but had not maneuvered our entire army into it, and he fell back so sullenly that those of us who followed, keeping him actually in sight, were a good deal more concerned about effecting a junction with the rest of our army than to push the pursuit. By the time that Rosecrans had got his three scattered corps together, we were a long way from Chattanooga, with our line of communication with it so exposed that Bragg turned to seize it. Chickamauga was a fight for possession of a road. Back along this road raced Crittenden's corps with those of Thomas and McCook, which had not before traversed it. The whole army was moving by its left. There was sharp fighting all along and all day, for the forest was so dense that the hostile lines came almost into contact before fighting was possible. One instance was particularly horrible. After some hours of close engagement, my brigade, with foul pieces and exhausted cartridge boxes, was relieved and withdrawn to the road to protect several batteries of artillery, probably two dozen pieces, which commanded an open field in the rear of our line. Before our weary and virtually disarmed men had actually reached the guns, the line in front gave way, fell back behind the guns, and went on, the Lord knows whither. A moment later the field was gray with Confederates in pursuit. 
Then the guns opened fire with grape and canister, and for perhaps five minutes, it seemed an hour, nothing could be heard but the infernal din of their discharge, and nothing seen through the smoke but a great ascension of dust from the smitten soil. When all was over, and the dust cloud had lifted, the spectacle was too dreadful to describe. The Confederates were still there, all of them, it seemed, some almost under the muzzles of the guns. But not a man of all these brave fellows was on his feet, and so thickly were all covered with dust that they looked as though they had been reclothed in yellow. "'We bury our dead,' said a gunner grimly, though doubtless all were afterward dug out, for some were partly alive. To a day of danger succeeded a night of waking. The enemy, everywhere held back from the road, continued to stretch his line northward in the hope to overlap us and put himself between us and Chattanooga. We neither saw nor heard his movement, but any man with half a head would have known that he was making it, and we met by a parallel movement to our left. By morning we had edged along a good way and thrown up rude entrenchments at a little distance from the road on the threatened side. The day was not very far advanced when we were attacked furiously all along the line, beginning at the left. When repulsed, the enemy came again and again. His persistence was dispiriting. He seemed to be using against us the law of probabilities. For so many efforts, one would eventually succeed. One did, and it was my luck to see it win. I had been sent by my chief, General Hazen, to order up some artillery ammunition and rode away to the right and rear in search of it. Finding an ordnance train, I obtained from the officer in charge a few wagons loaded with what I wanted, but he seemed in doubt as to our occupancy of the region across which I proposed to guide them. Although assured that I had just traversed it and that it lay immediately behind Wood's division, he insisted on riding to the top of the ridge behind which his train lay and overlooking the ground. We did so, when to my astonishment I saw the entire country in front swarming with Confederates. The very earth seemed to be moving toward us. They came on in thousands and so rapidly that we had barely time to turn tail and gallop down the hill and away, leaving them in possession of the train, many of the wagons being upset by frantic efforts to put them about. By what miracle that officer had sensed the situation I did not learn, for we parted company then and there, and I never again saw him. By a misunderstanding, Wood's division had been withdrawn from our line of battle just as the enemy was making an assault. Through the gap of half a mile, the Confederates charged without opposition, cutting our army clean in two. The right divisions were broken up, and with General Rosecrans in their midst, fled how they could across the country, eventually bringing up in Chattanooga, whence Rosecrans telegraphed to Washington the destruction of the rest of his army. The rest of his army was standing its ground. A good deal of nonsense used to be talked about the heroism of General Garfield, who caught in the rout of the right, nevertheless went back and joined the undefeated left under General Thomas. There was no great heroism in it. That is what every man should have done, including the commander of the army. We could hear Thomas's guns going, those of us who had ears for them, and all that was needful was to make a sufficiently wide detour and then move toward the sound. I did so myself, and have never felt that it ought to make me president. Moreover, on my way I met General Nagley, and my duties as topographical engineer, having given me some knowledge of the lay of the land, offered to pilot him back to glory or the grave. I am sorry to say my good offices were rejected a little uncivilly, which I charitably attributed to the general's obvious absence of mind. His mind, I think, was in Nashville, behind a breastwork. Unable to find my brigade, I reported to General Thomas, who directed me to remain with him. He had assumed command of all the forces still intact, and was pretty closely beset. The battle was fierce and continuous, the enemy extending his lines farther and farther around our right toward our line of retreat. We could not meet the extension otherwise than by refusing our right flank and letting him enclose us, which but for gallant Gordon Granger he would inevitably have done. This was the way of it. Looking across the fields in our rear, rather longingly, I had the happy distinction of a discoverer. What I saw was the shimmer of sunlight on metal. 
lines of troops were coming in behind us. The distance was too great, the atmosphere too hazy, to distinguish the color of their uniforms, even with a glass. Reporting my momentous find, I was directed by the general to go and see who they were. Galloping toward them until near enough to see that they were of our kidney, I hastened back with the glad tidings and was sent again to guide them to the general's position. It was General Granger with two strong brigades of the reserve, moving soldier-like toward the sound of heavy firing. Meeting him and his staff, I directed him to Thomas, and unable to think of anything better to do, decided to go visiting. I knew I had a brother in that gang, an officer of the Ohio Battery. I soon found him near the head of a column, and as we moved forward, we had a comfortable chat amongst such of the enemy's bullets as had inconsiderately been fired too high. The incident was a trifle marred by one of them unhorsing another officer of the battery, whom we propped up against a tree and left. A few moments later, Granger's force was put in on the right, and the fighting was terrific. By accident, I now found Hazen's brigade, or what remained of it, which had made a half-mile march to add itself to the unrouted at the memorable Snodgrass Hill. Hazen's first remark to me was an inquiry about that artillery ammunition that he had sent me for. It was needed badly enough, as were other kinds. For the last hour or two of that interminable day, Grangers were the only men that had enough ammunition to make a five minutes fight. Had the Confederates made one more general attack, we would have had to meet them with a the bayonet alone. I don't know why they did not. Probably they were short of ammunition. I know, though, that while the sun was taking its own time to set, we lived through the agony of at least one death each, waiting for them to come on. At last it grew too dark to fight. Then away to our left and rear some of Bragg's people set up the rebel yell. It was taken up successively and passed round to our front, along our right, and in behind us again, until it seemed almost to have got to the point whence it started. It was the ugliest sound that any mortal ever heard, even a mortal exhausted and unnerved by two days of hard fighting, without sleep, without rest, without food, and without hope. There was, however, a space somewhere at the back of us across which that horrible yell did not prolong itself, and through that we finally retired in profound silence and dejection unmolested. To those of us who have survived the attacks of both Bragg and Time, and who keep in memory the dear dead comrades whom we left upon that fateful field, the place means much. May it mean something less to the younger men whose tents are now pitched, where with bended heads and clasped hands God's great angels stood invisible among the heroes in blue and the heroes in gray, sleeping their last sleep in the woods of Chickamauga. End of A Little of Chickamauga Chapter 3 of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War Bits of Autobiography by Ambrose Bierce This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Crime at Pickett's Mill there is a class of events which by their very nature, and despite any intrinsic interest that they may possess, are foredoomed to oblivion. They are merged in the general story of those greater events of which they were a part, as the thunder of a billow breaking on a distant beach is unnoted in the continuous roar. To how many, having knowledge of the battles of our Civil War, does the name Pickett's Mill suggest acts of heroism and devotion performed in scenes of awful carnage to accomplish the impossible? Buried in the official reports of the victors, there are indeed imperfect accounts of the engagement. The vanquished have not thought it expedient to relate it. It is ignored by General Sherman in his memoirs, yet Sherman ordered it. General Howard wrote an account of the campaign of which it was an incident and dismissed it in a single sentence. Yet General Howard planned it, and it was fought as an isolated and independent action under his eye. Whether it was so trifling an affair as to justify this inattention, let the reader judge. The fight occurred on the 27th of May, 1864 while the armies of General Sherman and Johnson confronted each other near Dallas, Georgia. 
during the memorable Atlanta campaign. For three weeks we had been pushing the Confederates southward, partly by maneuvering, partly by fighting, out of Dalton, out of Rosaka, through Adairsville, Kingston, and Cassville. Each army offered battle everywhere, but would accept it only on its own terms. At Dallas, Johnson made another stand, and Sherman, facing the hostile line, began his customary maneuvering for an advantage. General Wood's division of Howard's Corps occupied a position opposite the Confederate right. Johnson, finding himself on the 26th, overlapped by Schofield, still farther to Wood's left, retired his right, Polk, across a creek, whither we followed him into the woods with a deal of desultory bickering and at nightfall had established the new lines at nearly a right angle with the old, Schofield reaching well around and threatening the Confederate rear. The civilian reader must not suppose when he reads accounts of military operations in which relative position of the forces are defined, as in the foregoing passages, that these were matters of general knowledge to those engaged. Such statements are commonly made, even by those high in command, in the light of later disclosures, such as the enemy's official reports. It is seldom, indeed, that a subordinate officer knows anything about the disposition of the enemy's forces, except that it is unamiable, or precisely whom he is fighting. As to the rank and file, they can know nothing more of the matter than the arms they carry. They hardly know what troops are upon their own right or left, the length of a regiment away. If it is a cloudy day, they are ignorant even of the points of the compass. It may be said generally, that a soldier's knowledge of what is going on about him is coterminous with his official relation to it and his personal connection with it. What is going on in front of him he does not know at all until he learns it afterward. At nine o'clock on the morning of the 27th, Wood's division was withdrawn and replaced by Stanley's. Supported by Johnson's division, it moved at ten o'clock to the left in the rear of Schofield, a distance of four miles through a forest and at two o'clock in the afternoon had reached a position where General Howard believed himself free to move in behind the enemy's forces and attack them in the rear, or at least, striking them in the flank, crush his way across their line in the direction of its length, throw them into confusion, and prepare an easy victory for a supporting attack in front. In selecting General Howard for this bold adventure, General Sherman was doubtless not unmindful of Chancellorsville, where Stonewall Jackson had executed a similar maneuver for Howard's instruction. Experience is a normal school. It teaches how to teach. There are some differences to be noted. At Chancellorsville, it was Jackson who attacked. At Pickett's Mill, Howard. At Chancellorsville, it was Howard who was assailed. At Pickett's Mill, Hood. The significance of the first distinction is doubled by that of the second. The attack, it was understood, was to be made in columns of brigades, Hazen's brigade of Wood's division leading. That such was at least Hazen's understanding I learned from his own lips during the movement, as I was an officer of his staff. But after a march of less than a mile, an hour, and a further delay of three hours at the end of it, to acquaint the enemy of our intention to surprise him, our single shrunken brigade of 1,500 men was sent forward without support to double up the army of General Johnson. We will put in Hazen and see what success he has. In these words of General Wood to General Howard, we were first apprised of the true nature of the distinction about to be conferred upon us. General W.B. Hazen, a born fighter, an educated soldier, after the war, chief signal officer of the Army, and now long dead, was the best hated man that I ever knew. And his very memory is a terror to every unworthy soul in the service. His was a stormy life. He was in trouble all around. Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, and a countless multitude of the less eminent luckless had the misfortune, at one time and another, to incur his disfavor, and he tried to punish them all. He was always, after the war, the central figure of a court-martial or a congressional inquiry, was accused of everything from stealing to cowardice, was banished to obscure posts, jumped on by the press, traduced in public and in private, and always emerged triumphant. 
while signal officer, he went up against the Secretary of War and put him to the controversial sword. He convicted Sheridan of falsehood, Sherman of barbarism, Grant of inefficiency. He was aggressive, arrogant, tyrannical, honorable, truthful, courageous, a skillful soldier, a faithful friend, and one of the most exasperating of men. Duty was his religion, and like the Moslem, he proselytized with the sword. His missionary efforts were directed chiefly against the spiritual darkness of his superiors in rank. Though he would turn aside from pursuit of his erring commander to set a chicken thieving orderly astride a wooden horse with a heavy stone attached to each foot. Hazen, said a brother brigadier, is a synonym of insubordination. For my commander and my friend, my master in the art of war, now unable to answer for himself, let this fact answer. When he heard Wood say that they would put him in and see what success he would have in defeating an army, when he saw Howard assent, he uttered never a word, rode to the head of his feeble brigade, and patiently awaited the command to go. Only by a look which I knew how to read did he betray his sense of the criminal blunder. The enemy had now had seven hours in which to learn of the movement and prepare to meet it. General Johnson says, The Federal troops extended their entrenched line, we did not entrench, so rapidly to their left that it was found necessary to transfer Claiborne's division to Hardy's Corps to our right, where it was formed on the prolongation of Polk's line. General Hood, commanding the enemy's right corps, says, On the morning of the 27th, the enemy were known to be rapidly extending their left, attempting to turn my right as they extended. Claiborne was deployed to meet them, and at half past 5 p.m., a very stubborn attack was made on this division, extending to the right, where Major General Wheeler, with his cavalry division, was engaging them. The assault was continued with great determination upon both Claiborne and Wheeler. That, then, was the situation. A weak brigade of 1,500 men, with masses of idle troops behind in the character of audience, waiting for the word to march a quarter mile uphill through impassable tangles of underwood, along and across precipitous ravines, and attack breastworks constructed at leisure, and manned with two divisions of troops as good as themselves. True, we did not know all this. But if any man on that ground besides Wood and Howard expected a walkover, his must have been a singularly hopeful disposition. As topographical engineer, it had been my duty to make a hasty examination of the ground in front. In doing so, I had pushed far enough forward through the forest to hear distinctly the murmur of the enemy awaiting us, and this had been duly reported. But from our lines nothing could be heard but the wind among the trees and the songs of birds. Someone said it was a pity to frighten them, but there would necessarily be more or less noise. We laughed at that. Men awaiting death on the battlefield laugh easily, though not infectiously. The brigade was formed in four battalions, two in front and two in rear. This gave us a front of about 200 yards. The right front battalion was commanded by Colonel R. L. Kimberly of the 41st Ohio the left by Colonel O. H. Payne of the 124th Ohio, the rear battalions by Colonel J. C. Foy, 23rd Kentucky, and Colonel W. W. Berry, 5th Kentucky, all brave and skillful officers, tested by experience on many fields. The whole command, known as the 2nd Brigade, 3rd Division, 4th Corps, consisted of no fewer than nine regiments, reduced by long service to an average of less than 200 men each. With full ranks and only the necessary details for special duty, we should have had some 8,000 rifles in line. We moved forward. In less than one minute, the trim battalions had become simply a swarm of men struggling through the undergrowth of the forest, pushing and crowding. The front was irregularly serrated, the strongest and bravest in advance, the others following in fan-like formations, variable and inconsistent, ever defining themselves anew. For the first two hundred yards, our course lay along the left bank of a small creek in a deep ravine, our left battalion sweeping along its steep slope. Then we came to the fork of the ravine, 
A part of us crossed below, the rest above, passing over both branches, the regiments inextricably intermingled, rendering all military formation impossible. The color-bearers kept well to the front with their flags, closely furled, slant backward over their shoulders. Displayed, they would have been torn to rags by the boughs of the trees. Horses were all sent to the rear, the general and staff and all the field officers toiled along on foot as best they could. "'We shall halt and form when we get out of this,' said an aide-de-camp. Suddenly there came the ringing rattle of musketry, the familiar hissing of bullets, and before us the interspaces of the forest were all blue with smoke. Hoarse, fierce yells broke out of a thousand throats. The forward fringe of brave and hardy assailants were arrested in its mutable extensions. The edge of our swarm grew dense and clearly defined as the foremost halted and the rest pressed forward to align themselves alongside them, all firing. The uproar was deafening. The air was sibilant with streams and sheets of missiles. In the steady, unvarying roar of small arms, the frequent shock of the cannon was rather felt than heard, but the gusts of grape which they blew into that populous wood were audible enough, screaming among the trees and cracking their stems and branches. We had, of course, no artillery to reply. Our brave color-bearers were all now in the forefront of battle in the open, for the enemy had cleared a space in front of his breastworks. They held the colors erect, shook out their glories, waved them forward and back to keep them spread, for there was no wind. From where I stood at the right of the line, we had halted and formed indeed. I could see six of our flags at one time. Occasionally one would go down, only to be instantly lifted by other hands. I must here quote again from General Johnson's account of this engagement, for nothing could more truly indicate the resolute nature of the attack than the Confederate belief that it was made by the whole Fourth Corps instead of one weak brigade. The Fourth Corps came on in deep order and assailed the Texans with great vigor, receiving their close and accurate fire with a fortitude always exhibited by General Sherman's troops in the actions of this campaign. The Federal troops approached within a few yards of the Confederates, but at last were forced to give way by the storm of well-directed bullets and fell back to the shelter of a hollow near and behind them. They left hundreds of corpses within twenty paces of the Confederate line. When the United States troops paused in their advance within fifteen paces of the Texan front rank, one of their color bearers planted his colors eight or ten feet in front of his regiment and was instantly shot dead. A soldier sprang forward to his place and fell also as he grasped the color staff. A second and third followed successively, and each received death as speedily as his predecessors. A fourth, however, seized and bore back the object of soldierly devotion. Such incidents have occurred in battle from time to time since men began to venerate the symbols of their cause, but they are not commonly related by the enemy. If General Johnson had known that his veteran divisions were throwing their successive lines against fewer than 1,500 men, his glowing tribute to his enemy's valor could hardly have been more generously expressed. I can attest the truth of his soldierly praise. I saw the occurrence that he relates, and regret that I am unable to recall even the name of the regiment whose colors were so gallantly saved. Early in my military experience I used to ask myself how it was that brave troops could retreat while still their courage was high. As long as a man is not disabled he can go forward. Can it be anything but fear that makes him stop and finally retire? Are there signs by which he can infallibly know the struggle to be hopeless? In this engagement, as in others, my doubts were answered as to the fact. The explanation is still obscure. In many instances which have come under my observation, when hostile lines of infantry engage at close range and the assailants afterward retire, there was a deadline beyond which no man advanced but to fall. Not a soul of them ever reached the enemy's front to be bayoneted or captured. It was a matter of the difference of three or four paces, too small a distance to affect the accuracy of aim. In these affairs no aim is taken at individual antagonists. The soldier delivers his fire at the thickest mass in his front. The fire is, of course, as deadly at twenty paces as at fifteen, at fifteen as at ten. Nevertheless, there is the deadline, with its well-defined edge of corpses, those of the bravest. Where both lines are fighting without cover, as in a charge met by a countercharge, each has its deadline, and between the two is a clear space, 
neutral ground, devoid of dead, for the living cannot reach it to fall there. I observed this phenomenon at Pickett's Mill. Standing at the right of the line, I had an unobstructed view of the narrow, open space across which the two lines fought. It was dim with smoke, but not greatly obscured. The smoke rose and spread in sheets among the branches of the trees. Most of our men fought kneeling as they fired, many of them behind trees, stones, and whatever cover they could get, but there were considerable groups that stood. Occasionally one of these groups, which had endured the storm of missiles for moments without perceptible reduction, would push forward, moved by a common despair, and wholly detach itself from the line. In a second every man of the group would be down. There had been no visible movement of the enemy, no audible change in the awful, even roar of the firing, yet all were down. Frequently the dim figure of an individual soldier would be seen to spring away from his comrades, advancing alone toward that fateful interspace with leveled bayonet. He got no farther than the farthest of his predecessors. Of the hundreds of corpses within twenty paces of the Confederate line, I venture to say that a third were within fifteen paces, and not one within ten. It is the perception, perhaps unconscious, of this inexplicable phenomenon that causes the still unharmed, still vigorous, and still courageous soldier to retire without ever having come into actual contact with his foe. He sees or feels that he cannot. His bayonet is a useless weapon for slaughter. Its purpose is a moral one. Its mandate exhausted, he sheathes it and trusts to the bullet. That failing, he retreats. He has done all that he could with such appliances as he has. No command to fall back was given. None could have been heard. Man by man, the survivors withdrew at will, sifting through the trees into the cover of the ravines, among the wounded who could draw themselves back, among the skulkers whom nothing could have dragged forward. The left of our short line had fought at the corner of a cornfield, the fence along the right side of which was parallel to the direction of our retreat. As the disorganized groups fell back along this fence, on the wooded side, they were attacked by a flanking force of the enemy, moving through the field in a direction nearly parallel with what had been our front. This force, I infer from General Johnson's account, consisted of the brigade of General Lowry, or two Arkansas regiments under Colonel Balcom. I had been sent by General Hazen to that point and arrived in time to witness this formidable movement. But already our retreating men, in obedience to their officers, their courage, and their instinct of self-preservation, had formed along the fence and opened fire. The apparently slight advantage of the imperfect cover and the open range worked its customary miracle. The assault, a singularly spiritless one, considering the advantages it promised, and that it was made by an organized and victorious force against a broken and retreating one, was checked. The assailants actually retired, and if they afterward renewed their movement, they encountered none but our dead and wounded. The battle as a battle was at an end, but there was still some slaughtering that it was possible to incur before nightfall and as the wreck of our brigade drifted back through the forest we met their brigade gibson's which had the attack been made in column as it should have been would have been but five minutes behind our heels with another five minutes behind its own as it was just forty-five minutes had elapsed during which the enemy had destroyed us and was now ready to perform the same kindly office for our successors neither gibson nor the brigade which was sent to his relief as tardily as he to ours accomplished or could have hoped to accomplish anything whatever i did not note their movements having other duties but hazen in his narrative of military service says i witnessed the attack of the two brigades following my own and none of these troops advanced nearer than one hundred yards of the enemy's works they went in at a run and as organizations were broken in less than a minute Nevertheless, their losses were considerable, including several hundred prisoners taken from a sheltered place whence they did not care to rise and run. The entire loss was about 1,400 men, of whom nearly one-half fell killed and wounded in Hazen's brigade in less than 30 minutes of actual fighting. General Johnson says, 
The federal dead lying near our line were counted by many persons, officers and soldiers. According to these counts, there were 700 of them. This is obviously erroneous, though I have not the means at hand to ascertain the true number. I remember that we were all astonished at the uncommonly large proportion of dead to wounded, a consequence of the uncommonly close range at which most of the fighting was done. The action took its name from a water power mill nearby. This was on a branch of a stream having, I am sorry to say, the prosaic name of Pumpkin Vine Creek. I have my own reasons for suggesting that the name of that water course be altered to Sunday School Run. End of Chapter 3、Chapter、Four of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War Bits of Autobiography By Ambrose Bierce. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What I Saw of Shiloh. One. It was plain that the enemy had retreated to Corinth. The arrival of our fresh troops and their successful passage of the river had disheartened him. Three or four of his gray cavalry videttes moving amongst the trees on the crest of a hill at our front. And galloping out of sight at the crack of our skirmishers' rifles confirmed us in the belief. An army face to face with its enemy does not employ cavalry to watch its front. True, they might be a general and his staff. Crowning this rise, we found a level field, a quarter of a mile in width. Beyond it, a gentle acclivity, covered with an undergrowth of young oaks, impervious to sight. We pushed on into the open, but the division halted at the edge. Having orders to conform to its movements, we halted too, but that did not suit. We received an intimation to proceed. I had performed this sort of service before, and in the exercise of my discretion, deployed my platoon, pushing it forward at a run with trailed arms to strengthen the skirmish line, which I overtook some thirty or forty yards from the wood. Then, I can't describe it. The forest seemed all at once to flame up and disappear with a crash like that of a great wave upon the beach, a crash that expired in hot hissings and the sickening splat of lead against flesh. A dozen of my brave fellows tumbled over like tenpins. Some struggled to their feet only to go down again and yet again. Those who stood fired into the smoking brush and doggedly retired. We had expected to find at most a line of skirmishers similar to our own. It was with a view to overcoming them by a sudden coup at the moment of collision that I had thrown forward my little reserve. What we had found was a line of battle, coolly holding its fire until it could count our teeth. There was no more to be done but get back across the open ground, every superficial yard of which was throwing up its little jet of mud provoked by an impinging bullet. We got back, most of us. And I shall never forget the ludicrous incident of a young officer who had taken part in the affair, walking up to his colonel, who had been a calm and apparently impartial spectator, and gravely reporting, "The enemy is in force just beyond this field, sir." Two. In subordination to the design of this narrative, as defined by its title, the incidents related necessarily group themselves about my own personality as a centre. And as this center, during the few terrible hours of the engagement, maintained a variably constant relation to the open field already mentioned, it is important that the reader should bear in mind the topographical and tactical features of the local situation. The hither side of the field was occupied by the front of my brigade, a length of two regiments in line with proper intervals for field batteries. During the entire fight, the enemy held the slight wooded acclivity beyond. The debatable ground to the right and left of the open was broken and thickly wooded for miles, in some places quite inaccessible to artillery, and at very few points offering opportunities for its successful employment. As a consequence of this, the two sides of the field were soon studded thickly with confronting guns, which flamed away at one another with amazing zeal and rather startling effect. Of course, an infantry attack delivered from either side was not to be thought of when the covered flanks offered inducements so unquestionably superior, and I believe the riddled bodies of my poor skirmishers were the only ones left on this neutral ground that day. But there was a very pretty line of dead continually growing in our rear, 
and doubtless the enemy had at his back a similar encouragement. The configuration of the ground offered us no protection. By lying flat on our faces between the guns, we were screened from view by a straggling row of brambles, which marked the course of an obsolete fence. But the enemy's grape was sharper than his eyes, and it was poor consolation to know that his gunners could not see what they were doing so long as they did it. The shock of our own pieces nearly deafened us, but in the brief intervals we could hear the battle roaring and stammering in the dark reaches of the forest to the right and left, where our other divisions were dashing themselves again and again into the smoking jungle. What would we not have given to join them in their brave, hopeless task? But to lie inglorious, beneath showers of shrapnel, darting divergent from the unassailable sky, meekly to be blown out of life by level gusts of grape, to clench our teeth and shrink helpless before big shot pushing noisily through the consenting air. This was horrible. Lie down there, Captain would shout, and then get up himself to see the disorder was obeyed. Captain, take cover, sir, the lieutenant colonel would shriek, pacing up and down in the most exposed position that he could find. Oh, those cursed guns! Not the enemy's, but our own. Had it not been for them, we might have died like men. They must be supported, forsooth, the feeble, boasting bullies. It was impossible to conceive that these pieces were doing the enemy as excellent a mischief as his were doing us. They seemed to raise their cloud by day solely to direct aright the streaming procession of Confederate missiles. They no longer inspired confidence, but begot apprehension. And it was with grim satisfaction that I saw the carriage of one and another smashed into matchwood by a whooping shot and bundled out of the line. 3. The dense forests, wholly or partly, in which were fought so many battles of the Civil War, lay upon the earth in each autumn a thick deposit of dead leaves and stems, the decay of which forms a soil of surprising depth and richness. In dry weather the upper stratum is as inflammable as tinder. A fire once kindled in it will spread with a slow, persistent advance as far as local conditions permit, leaving a bed of light ashes beneath which the less combustible accretions of previous years will smolder until extinguished by rains. In many of the engagements of the war, the fallen leaves took fire and roasted the fallen men. At Shiloh, during the first day's fighting, wide tracts of woodland were burned over in this way, and scores of wounded who might have recovered perished in slow torture. I remember a deep ravine, a little to the left and rear of the field I have described, in which by some mad freak of heroic incompetence, a part of an Illinois regiment had been surrounded, and refusing to surrender, was destroyed, as it very well deserved. My regiment, having at last been relieved at the guns and moved over to the heights above this ravine for no obvious purpose, I obtained leave to go down into the valley of death and gratify a reprehensible curiosity. Forbidding enough it was in every way. The fire had swept every superficial foot of it, and at every step I sank into ashes to the ankle. It had contained a thick undergrowth of young saplings, every one of which had been severed by a bullet, the foliage of the prostrate tops being afterward burnt and the stumps charred. Death had put his sickle into this thicket, and fire had gleaned the field. Along a line which was not that of extreme depression, but was at every point significantly equidistant from the heights on either hand, lay the bodies, half buried in ashes some in the unlovely looseness of attitude denoting sudden death by the bullet, but by far the greater number in postures of agony that told of the tormenting flame. Their clothing was half burnt away, their hair and beard entirely. The rain had come too late to save their nails. Some were swollen to double girth, others shriveled to mannequins. According to the degree of exposure, their faces were bloated and black, or yellow and shrunken. The contraction of muscles which had given them claws for hands had cursed each countenance with a hideous grin. Ah! I cannot catalogue the charms of these gallant gentlemen, who had got what they enlisted for. 4. 
It was now three o'clock in the afternoon and raining. For fifteen hours we had been wet to the skin. Chilled, sleepy, hungry, and disappointed, profoundly disgusted with the inglorious part to which they had been condemned, the men of my regiment did everything doggedly. The spirit had gone quite out of them. Blue sheets of powder smoke drifting amongst the trees, settling against the hillsides, and beaten into nothingness by the falling rain, filled the air with their peculiar pungent odor, but it no longer stimulated. For miles on either hand could be heard the hoarse murmur of the battle, breaking out nearby with frightful distinctness, or sinking to a murmur in the distance, and the one sound aroused no more attention than the other. We had been placed again in rear of those guns, but even they and their iron antagonists seemed to have tired of their feud, pounding away at one another with amiable infrequency. The right of the regiment extended a little beyond the field. On the prolongation of the line in that direction were some regiments of another division, with one in reserve. A third of a mile back lay the remnant of somebody's brigade looking to its wounds. The line of forest bounding this end of the field stretched as straight as a wall from the right of my regiment to heaven knows what regiment of the enemy. There suddenly appeared, marching down this wall, not more than two hundred yards in our front, a dozen files of gray-clad men with rifles on the right shoulder. At an interval of fifty yards they were followed by perhaps half as many more, and at fair supporting distance of these stalked with confident mane a single man. There seemed to me something indescribably ludicrous in the advance of this handful of men upon an army, albeit with their left flank protected by a forest. It does not so impress me now. They were the exposed flanks of three lines of infantry, each half a mile in length. In a moment our gunners had grappled with the nearest pieces, swung them half round, and were pouring streams of canister into the invaded wood. The infantry rose in masses, springing into line. Our threatened regiments stood like a wall, their loaded rifles at ready, their bayonets hanging quietly in the scabbards. The right wing of my own regiment was thrown slightly backward to threaten the flank of the assault. The battered brigade away to the rear pulled itself together. Then the storm burst. A great gray cloud seemed to spring out of the forest into the faces of the waiting battalions. It was received with a crash that made the very trees turn up their leaves. For one instant the assailants paused above their dead, then struggled forward, their bayonets glittering in the eyes that shone behind the smoke. One moment, and those unmoved men in blue would be impaled. What were they about? Why did they not fix bayonets? Were they stunned by their own volley? Their inaction was maddening. Another tremendous crash. The rear rank had fired. Humanity, thank heaven, is not made for this, and the shattered gray mass drew back a score of paces, opening a feeble fire. Lead had scored its old-time victory over steel. The heroic had broken its great heart against the commonplace. There are those who say that it is sometimes otherwise. All this had taken but a minute of time, and now the second Confederate line swept down and poured in its fire. The line of blue staggered and gave way. In these two terrific volleys it seemed to have quite poured out its spirit. To this deadly work our reserve regiment now came up with a run. It was surprising to see it spitting fire with never a sound, for such was the infernal din that the ear could take in no more. This fearful scene was enacted within fifty paces of our toes, but we were rooted to the ground as if we'd grown there. But now our commanding officer rode from behind us to the front, waved his hand with a courteous gesture that says, Après vous, and with a barely audible cheer, we sprang into the fight. Again the smoking front of gray receded, and again as the enemy's third line emerged from its leafy covert, it pushed forward across the piles of dead and wounded to threaten with protruded steel. Never was seen so striking a proof of the paramount importance of numbers. Within an area of three hundred yards by fifty, there struggled for front places no fewer than six regiments, and the accession of each, after the first collision, had it not been immediately counterposed, would have turned the scale. As matters stood, we were now very evenly matched, and how long we might have held out, God only knows, but all at once something appeared to have gone wrong with the enemy's left. 
our men had somewhere pierced his line. A moment later, his whole front gave way, and springing forward with fixed bayonets, we pushed him in utter confusion back to his original line. Here, among the tents from which Grant's people had been expelled the day before, our broken and disordered regiments inextricably intermingled, and drunken with a wine of triumph, dashed confidently against a pair of trim battalions, provoking a tempest of hissing lead that made us stagger under its very weight. The sharp onset of another against our flank sent us whirling back with fire at our heels and fresh foes in merciless pursuit, who in their turn were broken upon the front of the invalided brigade previously mentioned, which had moved up from the rear to assist us in this lively work. As we rallied to reform behind our beloved guns and noted the ridiculous brevity of our line, as we sank from sheer fatigue and tried to moderate the terrific thumping of our hearts, as we caught our breath to ask who had seen such and such a comrade, and laughed hysterically at the reply, there swept past us and over us into the open field a long regiment with fixed bayonets and rifles on the right shoulder. Another followed, and another, two, three, four. Heavens, where do all these men come from, and why did they not come before? How grandly and confidently they go, sweeping on like long blue waves of ocean, chasing one another to the cruel rocks. Involuntarily we draw in our weary feet beneath us as we sit, ready to spring up and interpose our breasts when these gallant lines shall come back to us across the terrible field, and sift brokenly through among the trees with spouting fires at their backs. We still are breathing to catch the full grandeur of the volleys that are to tear them to shreds. Minute after minute passes, and the sound does not come. Then for the first time we note that the silence of the whole region is not comparative, but absolute. Have we become stone deaf? See, here comes a stretcher-bearer, and there a surgeon. Good heavens! A chaplain! The battle was indeed at an end. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War: Bits of Autobiography by Ambrose Bierce. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four Days in Dixie. During a part of the month of October, eighteen sixty-four, the Federal and Confederate armies of Sherman and Hood, respectively having performed a surprising and resultless series of marches and countermarches since the fall of Atlanta, confronted each other along the separating line of the Coosa River in the vicinity of Galesville, Alabama. Here, for several days, they remained at rest. At least most of the infantry and artillery did. What the cavalry was doing, nobody but itself ever knew or greatly cared. It was an interregnum of expectancy between two regimes of activity. I was on the staff of Colonel McConnell, who commanded an infantry brigade in the absence of its regular commander. McConnell was a good man, but he did not keep a very tight rein upon the half-dozen restless and reckless young fellows who, for his sins, constituted his military family. In most matters we followed the trend of our desires, which commonly ran in the direction of adventure. It did not greatly matter what kind. In pursuance of this policy of escapades, one bright Sunday morning, Lieutenant Cobb, an aide-de-camp, and I mounted and set out to seek our fortunes, as the storybooks have it. Striking into a road of which we knew nothing except that it led toward the river, we followed it for a mile or such a matter, when we found our advance interrupted by a considerable creek, which we must ford or go back. We consulted a moment, and then rode at it as hard as we could, possibly in the belief that a high momentum would act as it does in the instance of a skater passing over thin ice. Cobb was fortunate enough to get across comparatively dry, but his hapless companion was utterly submerged. The disaster was all the greater from my having on a resplendent new uniform, of which I had been pardonably vain. Ah, what a gorgeous new uniform it never was again! A half hour devoted to wringing my clothing and dry charging my revolver, and we were away. A brisk canter of a half hour under the arches of the trees brought us to the river, where it was our ill luck to find a boat and three soldiers of our brigade. 
These men had been for several hours concealed in the brush, patiently watching the opposite bank in the amiable hope of getting a shot at some unwary Confederate, but had seen none. For a great distance up and down the stream on the other side, and for at least a mile back from it, extended cornfields. Beyond the cornfields, on slightly higher ground, was a thin forest, with breaks here and there in its continuity, denoting plantations, probably. No houses were in sight, and no camps. We knew that it was the enemy's ground, but whether his forces were disposed along the slightly higher country bordering the bottomlands, or at strategic points miles back, as ours were, we knew no more than the least curious private in our army. In any case, the river line would naturally be picketed or patrolled, but the charm of the unknown was upon us. The mysterious exerted its old-time fascination, beckoning to us from that silent shore so peaceful and dreamy in the beauty of the quiet Sunday morning. The temptation was strong, and we fell. The soldiers were as eager for the hazard as we, and readily volunteered for the madman's enterprise. Concealing our horses in a cane break, we unmoored the boat and rowed across unmolested. Arrived at a kind of landing on the other side, our first care was so to secure the boat under the bank as to favor a hasty re-embarking in case we should be so unfortunate as to incur the natural consequence of our act. Then, following an old road through the ranks of standing corn, we moved in force upon the Confederate position, five strong, with an armament of three Springfield rifles and two Colt's revolvers. We had not the further advantage of music and banners. One thing favored the expedition, giving it an apparent assurance of success. It was well officered, an officer to each man and a half. After marching about a mile, we came into a neck of woods and crossed an intersecting road, which showed no wheel tracks but was rich in hoof prints. We observed them and kept right on about our business, whatever that may have been. A few hundred yards further brought us to a plantation bordering our road upon the right. The fields, as was the southern fashion at that period of the war, were uncultivated and overgrown with brambles. A large white house stood at some little distance from the road. We saw women and children and a few negroes there. On our left ran the thin forest, pervious to cavalry. Directly ahead, an ascent in the road formed a crest beyond which we could see nothing. On this crest suddenly appeared two horsemen in gray, sharply outlined against the sky, men and animals looking gigantic. At the same instant a jingling and trampling were audible behind us, and turning in that direction I saw a score of mounted men moving forward at a trot. In the meantime the giants on the crest had multiplied surprisingly. Our invasion of the Gulf states had apparently failed. There was lively work in the next few seconds. The shots were thick and fast and uncommonly loud, none, I think, from our side. Cobb was on the extreme left of our advance, I on the right, about two paces apart. He instantly dived into the wood. The three men and I climbed across the fence somehow and struck out across the field, actuated doubtless by an intelligent forethought. Men on horseback could not immediately follow. Passing near the house, now swarming like a hive of bees, we made for a swamp two or three hundred yards away, where I concealed myself in a jungle, the others continuing, as a defeated commander would put it, to fall back. In my cover, where I lay panting like a hare, I could hear a deal of shouting and hard riding and an occasional shot. I heard someone calling dogs, and the thought of bloodhounds added its fine suggestiveness to the other fancies appropriate to the occasion. Finding myself unpursued after the lapse of what seemed an hour, but was probably a few minutes, I cautiously sought a place where, still concealed, I could obtain a view of the field of glory. The only enemy in sight was a group of horsemen on a hill a quarter of a mile away. Toward this group, a woman was running, followed by the eyes of everyone about the house. I thought she had discovered my hiding place and was going to give me away. Taking to my hands and knees, I crept as rapidly as possible among the clumps of brambles directly back toward the point in the road where we had met the enemy and failed to make him ours. There I dragged myself into a patch of briars within ten feet of the road where I lay undiscovered during the remainder of the day, listening to a variety of disparaging remarks upon Yankee valor and to dispiriting declarations of intention conditional on my capture. 
as members of the opposition passed and repassed and paused in the road to discuss the morning's events. In this way, I learned that the three privates had been headed off and caught within ten minutes. Their destination would naturally be Andersonville. What further became of them, God knows. Their captors passed the day making a careful canvas of the swamp for me. When night had fallen, I cautiously left my place of concealment, dodged across the road into the woods, and made for the river through the mile of corn. Such corn! It towered above me like a forest, shutting out all the starlight except what came from directly overhead. Many of the ears were a yard out of reach. One who has never seen an Alabama river-bottom cornfield has not exhausted nature's surprises, nor will he know what solitude is until he explores one in a moonless night. I came at last to the river bank, with its fringe of trees and willows and canes. My intention was to swim across, but the current was swift, the water forbiddingly dark and cold. A mist obscured the other bank. I could not, indeed, see the water more than a few yards out. It was a hazardous and horrible undertaking, and I gave it up, following cautiously along the bank in search of the spot where we had moored the boat. True, it was hardly likely that the landing was now unguarded, or, if so, that the boat was still there. Cobb had undoubtedly made for it, having an even more urgent need than I. But hope springs eternal in the human breast, and there was a chance that he had been killed before reaching it. I came at last into the road that we had taken, and consumed half the night in cautiously approaching the landing, pistol in hand and heart in mouth. The boat was gone. I continued my journey along the stream in search of another. My clothing was still damp from my morning bath, my teeth rattled with cold, but I kept on along the stream until I reached the limit of the cornfields and entered a dense wood. Through this I groped my way inch by inch, when suddenly emerging from a thicket into a space slightly more open, I came upon a smoldering campfire, surrounded by prostrate figures of men, upon one of whom I had almost trodden. A sentinel, who ought to have been shot, sat by the embers, his carbine across his lap, his chin upon his breast. Just beyond was a group of unsaddled horses. The men were asleep. The sentinel was asleep. The horses were asleep. There was something indescribably uncanny about it all. For a moment I believed them all lifeless, and O'Hara's familiar line, The Bivouac of the Dead, quoted itself in my consciousness. The emotion that I felt was that inspired by a sense of the supernatural. Of the actual and imminent peril of my position I had no thought. When at last it occurred to me I felt it as a welcome relief, and stepping silently back into the shadow retraced my course without having awakened a soul. The vividness with which I can now recall that scene is to me one of the marvels of memory. Getting my bearings again with some difficulty, I now made a wide detour to the left in the hope of passing around this outpost and striking the river beyond. In this mad attempt I ran across a more vigilant sentinel, posted in the heart of a thicket, who fired at me without challenging. To a soldier, an unexpected shot, ringing out at dead of night, is fraught with an awful significance. In my circumstances, cut off from my comrades, groping about an unknown country, surrounded by invisible perils which such a signal would call into eager activity, the flash and shock of that firearm were unspeakably dreadful. In any case, I should and ought to have fled, and did so. But how much or little of conscious prudence there was in the prompting I do not care to discover by analysis of memory. I went back into the corn, found the river, followed it back a long way, and mounted into the fork of a low tree. There I perched until the dawn, a most uncomfortable bird. In the gray light of the morning I discovered that I was opposite an island of considerable length separated from the mainland by a narrow and shallow channel, which I promptly waded. The island was low and flat, covered with an almost impenetrable cane break interlaced with vines. Working my way through these to the other side, I obtained another look at God's country, Shermany, so to speak. There were no visible inhabitants. The forest and the water met. This did not deter me. For the chill of the water I had no further care and laying off my boots and outer clothing, I prepared to swim. 
A strange thing now occurred. More accurately, a familiar thing occurred at a strange moment. A black cloud seemed to pass before my eyes. The water, the trees, the sky, all vanished into profound darkness. I heard the roaring of a great cataract, felt the earth sinking from beneath my feet. Then I heard and felt no more. At the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain in the previous June, I had been badly wounded in the head, and for three months was incapacitated for service. In truth, I had done no actual duty since, being then, as for many years afterward, subject to fits of fainting, sometimes without assignable immediate cause, but mostly when suffering from exposure, excitement, or excessive fatigue. This combination of them all had broken me down, most opportunely, it would seem. When I regained my consciousness, the sun was high. I was still giddy and half-blind. To have taken to the water would have been madness. I must have a raft. Exploring my island, I found a pen of slender logs, an old structure without roof or rafters, built for what purpose I do not know. Several of these logs I managed with patient toil to detach and convey to the water, where I floated them, lashing them together with vines. Just before sunset, my raft was complete and freighted with my outer clothing, boots, and pistol. Having shipped the last article, I returned into the break, seeking something from which to improvise a paddle. While peering about, I heard a sharp metallic click, the cocking of a rifle. I was a prisoner. The history of this great disaster to the Union arms is brief and simple. A Confederate home guard, hearing something going on upon the island, rode across, concealed his horse, and still hunted me. And reader, when you are held up in the same way, may it be by as fine a fellow. He not only spared my life, but even overlooked a feeble and ungrateful after-attempt upon his own, the particulars of which I shall not relate, merely exacting my word of honor that I would not again try to escape while in his custody. Escape? I could not have escaped a newborn babe. At my captor's house that evening there was a reception, attended by the elite of the whole vicinity. A Yankee officer in full fig, minus only the boots, which could not be got on his swollen feet, was something worth seeing, and those who came to scoff remained to stare. What most entertained them, I think, was my eating, an entertainment that was prolonged to a late hour. They were a trifle disappointed by the absence of horns, hoof, and tail, but bore their chagrin with good-natured fortitude. Among my visitors was a charming young woman from the plantation, where we had met the foe the day before the same lady whom I had suspected of an intention to reveal my hiding place. She had had no such design. She had run over to the group of horsemen to learn if her father had been hurt, by whom I should like to know. No restraint was put upon me. My captor even left me with the women and children and went off for instructions as to what disposition he should make of me. Altogether, the reception was a pronounced success though it is to be regretted that the guest of the evening had the incivility to fall dead asleep in the midst of the festivities, and was put to bed by sympathetic, and he has reason to believe, fair hands. The next morning I was started off to the rear in custody of two mounted men, heavily armed. They had another prisoner, picked up in some raid beyond the river. He was a most offensive brute a foreigner of some mongrel sort with just sufficient command of our tongue to show that he could not control his own. We traveled all day, meeting occasional small bodies of cavalrymen, by whom, with one exception, a Texan officer, I was civilly treated. My guard said, however, that if we should chance to meet Jeff Gatewood, he would probably take me from them and hang me to the nearest tree, and once or twice, hearing horsemen approach, they directed me to stand aside, concealed in the brush, one of them remaining nearby to keep an eye on me, the other going forward with my fellow prisoner, for whose neck they seemed to have less tenderness, and whom I heartily wished well hanged. Jeff Gatewood was a guerrilla chief of local notoriety, who was a greater terror to his friends than to his other foes. My guards related almost incredible tales of his cruelties and infamies. By their account, it was into his camp that I had blundered on Sunday night. We put up for the night at a farmhouse, having gone not more than fifteen miles owing to the condition of my feet. 
Here we got a bite of supper and were permitted to lie before the fire. My fellow prisoner took off his boots and was soon sound asleep. I took off nothing, and despite exhaustion remained equally sound awake. One of the guards also removed his footwear and outer clothing, placed his weapons under his neck, and slept the sleep of innocence. The other sat in the chimney corner on watch. The house was a double log cabin with an open space between the two parts roofed over, a common type of habitation in that region. The room we were in had its entrance in this open space, the fireplace opposite at the end. Beside the door was a bed occupied by the old man of the house and his wife. It was partly curtained off from the room. In an hour or two, the chap on watch began to yawn, then to nod. Pretty soon he stretched himself on the floor, facing us, pistol in hand. For a while he supported himself on his elbow, then laid his hand on his arm, blinking like an owl. I performed an occasional snore, watching him narrowly between my eyelashes from the shadow of my arm. The inevitable occurred. He slept audibly. A half hour later I rose quietly to my feet, particularly careful not to disturb the blackguard at my side, and moved as silently as possible. Despite my care, the latch clicked. The old lady sat bolt upright in bed and stared at me. She was too late. I sprang through the door and struck out for the nearest point of woods in a direction previously selected, vaulting fences like an accomplished gymnast and followed by a multitude of dogs. It is said that the state of Alabama has more dogs than schoolchildren and that they cost more for their upkeep. The estimate of cost is probably too high. Looking backward as I ran, I saw and heard the place in turmoil and uproar, and to my joy, the old man, evidently oblivious to the facts of the situation, was lifting up his voice and calling his dogs. They were good dogs. They went back. Otherwise, the malicious old rascal would have had my skeleton. Again, the traditional bloodhound did not materialize. Other pursuit, there was no reason to fear. My foreign gentleman would occupy the attention of one of the soldiers, and in the darkness of the forest I could easily elude the other, or, if need be, get him at a disadvantage. In point of fact, there was no pursuit. I now took my course by the North Star, which I can never sufficiently bless, avoiding all roads and open places about houses, laboriously boring my way through forests, driving myself like a wedge into brush and bramble, swimming every stream I came to, some of them more than once, probably, and pulling myself out of the water by boughs and briars, whatever could be grasped. Let anyone try to go a little way across even the most familiar country on a moonless night, and he will have an experience to remember. By dawn I had probably not made three miles. My clothing and skin were alike in rags. During the day I was compelled to make wide detours to avoid even the fields unless they were of corn but in other respects the going was distinctly better. A light breakfast of raw sweet potatoes and persimmons cheered the inner man. A good part of the outer was decorating the several thorns, boughs, and sharp rocks along my sylvan wake. Late in the afternoon I found the river, at what point it was impossible to say. After a half-hour's rest, concluded with a fervent prayer that I might go to the bottom, I swam across. Creeping up the bank, and holding my course still northward through a dense undergrowth, I suddenly reeled into a dusty highway, and saw a more heavenly vision than ever the eyes of a dying saint were blessed with all. Two patriots in blue carrying a stolen pig slung upon a pole. Late that evening, Colonel McConnell and his staff were chatting by a campfire in front of his headquarters. They were in a pleasant humor. Someone had just finished a funny story about a man cut in two by a cannon shot. Suddenly something staggered in among them from the outer darkness and fell into the fire. Somebody dragged it out by what seemed to be a leg. They turned the animal on its back and examined it. They were no cowards. "'What is it, Cobb?' said the chief, who had not taken the trouble to rise. "'I don't know, Colonel, but thank God it is dead.' It was not. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War Bits of Autobiography by Ambrose Bierce 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What Occurred at Franklin For several days, in snow and rain, General Schofield's little army had crouched in its hastily constructed defenses at Columbia, Tennessee. It had retreated in hot haste from Pulaski, thirty miles to the south, arriving just in time to foil Hood, who, marching from Florence, Alabama, by another road, with a force of more than double our strength, had hoped to intercept us. Had he succeeded, he would indubitably have bagged the whole bunch of us. As it was, he simply took position in front of us and gave us plenty of employment, but did not attack. He knew a trick worth two of that. Duck River was directly in our rear. I suppose both our flanks rested on it. The town was between them. One night, that of November 27, 1864, we pulled up stakes and crossed to the north bank to continue our retreat to Nashville, where Thomas and safety lay, such safety as is known in war. It was high time, too, for before noon of the next day, Forrest's cavalry forded the river a few miles above us and began pushing back our own horse toward Spring Hill, ten miles in our rear, on our only road. Why our infantry was not immediately put in motion toward the threatened point, so vital to our safety, General Schofield could have told better than I. Howbeit, we lay there inactive all day. The next morning, a bright and beautiful one, the brigade of Colonel P. Sidney Post was thrown out up the river four or five miles to see what it could see. What it saw was Hood's head of column coming over on a pontoon bridge, and a right pretty spectacle it would have been to one whom it did not concern. It concerned us rather keenly. As a member of Colonel Post's staff, I was naturally favored with a good view of the performance. We formed in line of battle at a distance of perhaps a half mile from the bridgehead, but that unending column of gray and steel gave us no more attention than if we had been a crowd of farmer folk. Why should it? It had only to face to the left to be itself a line of battle. Meantime, it had more urgent business on hand than brushing away a small brigade whose only offense was curiosity. It was making for Spring Hill with all its legs and wheels. Hour after hour, we watched that unceasing flow of infantry and artillery toward the rear of our army. It was an unnerving spectacle, yet we never for a moment doubted that acting on the intelligence supplied by our succession of couriers, our entire force was moving rapidly to the point of contact. The Battle of Spring Hill was obviously decreed. Obviously, too, our brigade of observation would be among the last to have a hand in it. The thought annoyed us, made us restless and resentful. Our mounted men rode forward and back behind the line, nervous and distressed. The men in the ranks sought relief in frequent changes of posture and shifting their weight from one leg to the other, in needless inspection of their weapons, and in that unfailing resource of the discontented soldier, audible damning of those in the saddles of authority. But never for more than a moment at a time did anyone remove his eyes from that fascinating and portentous pageant. Toward evening we were recalled, to learn that of our five divisions of infantry, with their batteries, numbering 23,000 men, only one, Stanley's, 4,000 weak, had been sent to Spring Hill to meet that formidable movement of Hood's three veteran corps. Why Stanley was not immediately effaced is still a matter of controversy. Hood, who was early on the ground, declared that he gave the needful orders and tried vainly to enforce them. Cheatham, in command of his leading corps, declared that he did not. Doubtless the dispute is still being carried on between these chieftains from their beds of Asphodel and Moly and Elysium. So much is certain. Stanley drove away Forrest and successfully held the junction of the roads against Claiborne's division, the only infantry that attacked him. That night the entire Confederate army lay within a half mile of our road, while we all sneaked by infantry, artillery, and trains. The enemy's campfire shone redly, miles of them, seeming only a stone's throw from our hurrying column. His men were plainly visible about them, cooking their suppers, a sight so incredible that many of our own, thinking them friends, strayed over to them and did not return. 
At intervals of a few hundred yards, we passed dim figures on horseback by the roadside, enjoining silence. Needless precaution. We could not have spoken if we had tried, for our hearts were in our throats. But fools are God's peculiar care, and one of his protective methods is the stupidity of other fools. By daybreak, our last man and last wagon had passed the fateful spot unchallenged, and our first were entering Franklin, ten miles away. Despite spirited cavalry attacks on trains and rear guard, all were in Franklin by noon, and such of the men as could be kept awake were throwing up a slight line of defense and closing the town. Franklin lies, or at that time did lie, I know not what exploration might now disclose, on the south bank of a small river, the Harpeth by name. For two miles southward was a nearly flat, open plain, extending to a range of low hills through which passed the turnpike by which we had come. From some bluffs on the precipitous north bank of the river was a commanding overlook of all this open ground, which, although more than a mile away, seemed almost at one's feet. On this elevated ground the wagon train had been parked, and General Schofield had stationed himself, the former for security, the latter for outlook. Both were guarded by General Wood's infantry division, of which my brigade was a part. "'We are in beautiful luck,' said a member of the division staff. With some prevision of what was to come, and a lively recollection of the nervous strain of helpless observation, I did not think it luck. In the activity of battle, one does not feel one's hair going gray with vicissitudes of emotion. For some reason, to the writer unknown, General Schofield had brought along with him General D.S. Stanley, who commanded two of his divisions, ours and another, which was not in luck. In the ensuing battle, when this excellent officer could stand the strain no longer, he bolted across the bridge like a shot and found relief in the hell below, where he was promptly tumbled out of the saddle by a bullet. Our line, with its reserve brigades, was about a mile and a half long, both flanks on the river, above and below the town, a mere bridgehead. It did not look a very formidable obstacle to the march of an army of more than 40,000 men. In a more tranquil temper than his failure at Spring Hill had put him into, Hood would probably have passed around our left and turned us out with ease, which would justly have entitled him to the Humane Society's great gold medal. Apparently that was not his day for saving life. About the middle of the afternoon our field glasses picked up the Confederate head of column emerging from the range of hills previously mentioned, where it was cut by the Columbia Road. But, ominous circumstance, it did not come on. It turned to its left at a right angle, moving along the base of the hills parallel to our line. Other heads of columns came through other gaps and over the crests farther along, impudently deploying on the level ground with a spectacular display of flags and glitter of arms. I do not remember that they were molested, even by the guns of General Wagner, who had been foolishly posted with two small brigades across the turnpike, half mile in our front, where he was needless for appraisal and powerless for resistance. My recollection is that our fellows down there in their shallow trenches noted these portentous dispositions without the least manifestation of incivility. As a matter of fact, many of them were permitted by their compassionate officers to sleep. And truly, it was good weather for that. Sleep was in the very atmosphere. The sun burned crimson in a gray-blue sky through a delicate Indian summer haze as beautiful as a daydream in paradise. If one had been given to moralizing, one would have found material aplenty for homilies in the contrast between the peaceful autumn afternoon and the bloody business that it had in hand. If any good chaplain failed to improve the occasion, let us hope that he lived to lament in sackcloth of gold and ashes of roses his intellectual unthrift. The putting of that army into battle shape, its change from columns into lines, could not have occupied more than an hour or two. Yet it seemed an eternity. Its leisurely evolutions were irritating, but at last it moved forward with a toning rapidity, and the fight was on. First, the storm struck Wagner's isolated brigades, which, vanishing in fire and smoke, instantly reappeared as a confused mass of fugitives, inextricably intermingled with their pursuers. 
They had not stayed the advance a moment, and as might have been foreseen, were now a peril to the main line, which could protect itself only by the slaughter of its friends. To the right and left, however, our guns got into play, and simultaneously a furious infantry fire broke out along the entire front, the paralyzed center accepted. But nothing could stay those gallant rebels from a hand-to-hand -hand encounter with bayonet and butt, and it was accorded to them with hearty good will. Meantime, Wagner's conquerors were pouring across the breastwork like water over a dam. The guns that had spared the fugitives had now no time to fire. Their infantry supports gave way, and for a space of more than 200 yards in the very center of our line, the assailants, mad with exultation, had everything their own way. From the right and left, their gray masses converged into the gap, pushed through, and then, spreading, turned our men out of the works, so hardly held against the attack in their front. From our viewpoint on the bluff, we could mark the constant widening of the gap, the steady encroachment of that blazing and smoking mass against its disordered opposition. It is all up with us, said Captain Dawson of Woodstaff. I'm going to have a quiet smoke. I do not doubt that he supposed himself to have borne the heat and burden of the strife. In the midst of his preparations for a smoke, he paused and looked again. A new tumult of musketry had broken loose. Colonel Emerson Opdyke had rushed his reserve brigade into the melee and was bitterly disputing the Confederate advantage. Other fresh regiments joined in the countercharge, commanderless groups of retreating men returning to their work, and there ensued a hand-to-hand -hand contest of incredible fury. Two long, irregular, mutable, and tumultuous blurs of color were consuming each other's edge along the line of contact. Such devil's work does not last long, and we had the great joy to see it ending not as it began, but more nearly to the heart's desire. Slowly the mobile blur moved away from the town, and presently the gray half of it dissolved into its elemental units all in slow recession. The retaken guns in the embrasures pushed up towering clouds of white smoke. To east and to west along the reoccupied parapet ran a line of misty red till the spitfire crest was without a break from flank to flank. Probably there was some Yankee cheering, as doubtless there had been the rebel yell, but my memory recalls neither. There are many battles in a war, and many incidents in a battle. One does not recollect everything. Possibly I have not a retentive ear. While this lively work had been doing in the center, there had been no lack of diligence elsewhere, and now all were as busy as bees. I have read of many successive attacks, charge after charge, but I think the only assaults after the first were those of the second Confederate lines and possibly some of the reserves. Certainly there were no visible abatement and renewal of effort anywhere except where the men who had been pushed out of the works backward tried to re-enter, and all the time there was fighting. After resetting their line, the victors could not clear their front, for the baffled assailants would not desist. All over the open country in their rear, clear back to the base of the hills, drifted the wreck of battle, the wounded that were able to walk. And through the receding throng pushed forward here and there horsemen with orders, and footmen whom we knew to be bearing ammunition. There were no wagons, no caissons. The enemy was not using and could not use his artillery. Along the line of fire we could see, dimly in the smoke, mounted officers, singly and in small groups, attempting to force their horses across the slight parapet, but all went down. Of this devoted band was the gallant General Adams, whose body was found upon the slope, and whose animal's forefeet were actually inside the crest. General Claiborne lay a few paces farther out, and five or six other general officers sprawled elsewhere. It was a great day for Confederates on the line of promotion. For many minutes at a time, broad spaces of battle were veiled in smoke. Of what might be occurring there, conjecture gave a terrifying report. In a visible peril, observation is a kind of defense. Against the unseen, we lift a trembling hand. Always from these regions of obscurity we expected the worst but always the lifted cloud revealed an unaltered situation. The assailants began to give away. There was no general retreat. At many points the fight continued with lessening ferocity and lengthening range well into the night. It became an affair of twinkling musketry and broad flares of artillery. Then it sank to silence in the dark. Under orders to continue his retreat, 
Schofield could now do so unmolested. Hood had suffered so terrible a loss in life and morale that he was in no condition for effective pursuit. As at Spring Hill, daybreak found us on the road with all our implementa, except some of our wounded, and that night we encamped under the protecting guns of Thomas at Nashville. Our gallant enemy audaciously followed and fortified himself within rifle reach, where he remained for two weeks without firing a gun and was then destroyed. End of chapter 6 End of Iconoclastic Memories of the Civil War, Bits of Autobiography by Ambrose Bierce Recording by Winston Tharp